My name is Daniel Pritchard, and I'm the marketing director for Boston Review. Uh, Boston Review is a magazine of ideas, independent and nonprofit. We, we cover a wide range of material from global politics to economics um, to fiction and poetry and film. And you can pick up a copy up here at the front at the end of the lecture, and it includes the forum on the future of black politics uh, upon which this event is based. Uh, we have a, a very distinguished panel today, and we're very pleased to have them. Uh, we'll begin with a presentation by our lead speaker, Michael Dawson, and then our moderator, I believe, Melissa Nobles. She's, um, she's running a bit behind, but she said just start without her. Um, she's going to pick it up and uh, facilitate a discussion of the issue with the rest of the panel, and we're going to close with a brief question and answer uh, with, with the audience. So uh, Michael Dawson is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. He is the author of the lead essay in our January forum, The Future of Black Politics, as well as the book, Not in Our Lifetime, The Future of Black Politics. Andrew Gillespie is Associate Professor of Political Science at Emory University and a visiting professor here at MIT Political Science. Her research focuses on the political leadership of African Americans born after the Civil Rights Movement. And her forthcoming book is The New Black Politician, Cory Booker, Newark, and Post-Racial America. J. Philip Thompson is Associate Professor of Urban Politics at MIT. Before entering academic life, Professor Thompson was the Deputy General Manager of the New York Housing Authority, as well as Director of the Mayor's Office of Housing Coordination. Following Hurricane Katrina, Professor Thompson coordinated MIT's technical assistance efforts in the Gulf. He is the author of Double Trouble, Black Mayors, Black Communities, and the Call for a Deep Democracy. <coughs> And our moderator for today's event, who will be here shortly, is Professor Melissa Nobles of the, she's the uh, Arthur and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science at, here at MIT. Her research interests are the comparative study of racial and ethnic politics and issues of retrospective justice. Her most recent book is The Politics of Public Apologies. Uh, so to start, please help me welcome Professor Michael Dawson. Thank you, Daniel, and I hope everyone's doing well this afternoon. Last night, our discussion on the future of black politics reemphasized that those of us who believe it's critical that we rebuild black politics are facing a difficult but essential task. It's a task that is essential to moving forward the centuries-old quest for racial justice. It's a necessary task in order to fight economic injustice. And <laughs> <laughs> and inequality. We got our exercise in there. <laughs> 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 MIT ensures that. <laughs> it's a necessary t task for once again trying to transform a degenerate and corrupt American politics into something that resembles a democratic and progressive politics. It's a difficult task because <clears throat> we have to challenge, if necessary, replace a black political leadership that has all too frequently abandoned the struggle for economic justice, and in doing so abandoned most po poor and vulnerable members of our communities, often black women and children. It also means challenging white Americans, including much of the progressive community, to realize that to fight racial inequality is still vitally needed and cannot be relegated to a secondary status. It seems this later argument is one we've been having for well over a century. To be blunt, we have to convince too large a segment of black political leadership and elites in and outside of the academy that we cannot afford to ignore the ravages of an increasingly savage capitalist order. And we have to convince too large a segment of the predominantly white progressive community that we have to continue our bad battles against white supremacy. The lack of a progressive black political movement thieves the view popular among some Americans, and I'm going to say lack, I don't mean there isn't a pro aren't progressive black political movements, but they're not, ne neither as strong or as unified <coughs> or coordinated regionally and nationally as they need to be, that we live in a post-racial society. But our apparent post-racial order signified by President Obama's election and inauguration is an illusion. 
the black poor of an evening find themselves in conditions of greater deprivation now than any time in the recent past. Racial inequality remains a brutal fact of life in this century. Black poverty run, rates run twice that of, of whites and disproportionately high unemployment due to the economic pressures of neoliberalism, <coughs> as well as racial discrimination is a persistent cause. High levels of poverty, the concentration of blacks in segregated areas, areas and discriminatory loan practices magnify the mortgage crisis in black communities. Compounding economic disadvantage, the extraordinary rate of incarceration in African Americans is a disaster. African Americans also face severe health challenges for lack of insurance to poor quality health care and the effect of the AIDS crisis. The health crisis is also magnified by both black mass incarceration and economic deprivation. The interracial political unity that some have argued is supposed to herald a truly post-racial society also does not exist, as I document in my recent book, Not In Our Lifetimes. People who live at the bottom of the social order, especially at the bottom of more than one of its hierarchies, are frequently condemned to a life of crippling disadvantage. The existence of such mutually reinforcing power hierarchies calls the social order itself into question as a matter of justice. What is needed for our quest for racial justice in the United States today. One element that I'm going to argue today that needs to be added, not the only element, is a healthy black politics. Black politics, African Americans' ability to mobilize, influence policy, demand accountability from government officials, participate in American political discourse, and ultimately offer a democratic alternative to the status quo, have at times formed the leading edge of American democratic and progressive movements. Black visions in some areas have been the, some of the more robust, egalitarian, and expansive American democratic visions. This status has been lost. Decline of progressive black, progressive black politics is apparent in much of the, of the politics of today. Um, the Occupy actions that have swept across <coughs> the country to protest racial, uh, to economic inequality and economic injustice have had sporadic black participation depending on the venue. There's certainly been some black participation in areas such as Chicago, Oakland, and elsewhere. But for the most part, the mainstream of black politics has been divorced from the, the struggle against economic inequality as embodied within the Occupy movement. Yet both today, black communities and black political traditions have much to offer progressive politics in the United States. Blacks, we know from some public opinion research, including some of the research that my, my colleagues and I have conducted over the last few years, are more supportive of state action to redistribute wealth and bring about a more equal and just society than any other group of Americans. They are also the, strong, the strongest opponents of U.S. military intervention and oppose the 2003 intervention in Iraq at far, far higher rates than did any other group. Black progressive tradition have long offered a more just and democratic vision than is usually found in American political discourse. Ida B. Wells, Marcus Garvey, William Monroe Trotter, Ella Baker, Hubert Harrison, A. Philip Randolph, Cyril Briggs, and W.E. Du Bois are just a few of the many activist theoreticians who led movements dedicated to fighting for both racial and economic justice. Today, there's a disconnect between black organizing and other mobilizations in many, in many areas, not everywhere, on behalf of labor, immigration, and, ra and radical economic reform. Even worse, the black civil society that in the past supported a flourishing black activism today weaker than it was for most of the 20th century. Without a mobilized black politics, American democracy is even more vulnerable to internal attacks by those who have open, been openly suspicious and hostile <coughs> to democracy in the United States. Some of the responsibility for this state of affairs must be laid at the doorstep of the current generation of black politicians and elites, in many ways exemplified by President Obama. This generation of politicians and elites often still sees itself as on the side of those who fight against all forms of injustice. While this may or may not be true, at least in their minds, of members of this stratum, what is true that the a very large segment of this elite group of black politicians and others have embraced reactionary liberal ideology with extremely harmful effects on political movements seeking <coughs> racial and economic justice. Neoliberal ideology calls for the privatization of what should be public services, ranging from health care and prisons to even parking and water supply leaving government workers prey to unfair labor practices and or unemployment, and public service is reorganized not for efficiency, but for gouging the maximum profit possible from taxpayers. Neoliberal ideology for narrowing the scope of politics to just electoral politics, and looks with suspicion on the more democratic forms of mobilization, such as mass protest. 
Neoliberal ideology calls for narrowing a political discourse to just that which celebrates markets and the liberal capitalist order to the exclusion of more radical and critical analysis and speech. This leads to the demonization and exclusion of much black speech, when, such as when then-candidate Obama called the politics of Reverend Jeremiah Wright <coughs> outside of the mainstream of acceptable uh, political discourse, when in fact, excuse me, Wright's politics are well within cur the current mainstream of black discourse. Markets and profit-seeking firms are celebrated as a model by which all institutions, artistic organizations, foundations, university, healthcare institutions, prisons, etc., should follow with devastating consequences for the mission of those institutions. Neoliberal ideology calls for support of free trade agreements, even when those agreements accelerate the attack on labor rights, environmental concerns, and health and safety of workers and communities. Fine neoliberal ideology partners with neoconservative politics in supporting imperialist innovations in the name of free trade, preserving the global financial community's excess profits, or sometimes quite cynically, in the name of human rights. In some, the embrace of neoliberal ideology by black elites serves to deprive those seeking social, economic, and racial justice from illogical, tactical, political, discursive, and democratic tools that have served us so well in the past and are absolutely necessary for building progressive movements for justice going forward. Rebuilding black progressive movements requires recovering the spirit and politics of Martin Luther King Jr. of 1967 and 1968, the king of, from his <coughs> book, Where Do We Go From Here? This king was anti-war and anti-imperialist <coughs> and severe critic of both the excesses of communists and the savage denigration of poor people inherent in unregulated capitalism. This was a keen to explain, quote, black power in, in its broad and positive meaning as a call to black people to amass political and economic strength to achieve their legitimate goals, unquote. Among the many still relevant lessons of where do we go from here is that blacks need to fight both for black power and against the ravages of capitalism on behalf of all of those who are disadvantaged. We need to reconstruct black politics. <coughs> black solidarity and rage must be institutionalized and organized, not simply felt. Independent black organizations are are one effective way to do that. We need not and should not copy the movements of an early generation, but should instead follow their lead by building movements based on our own contemporary realities. One of the hallmarks of both the black liberation movement in the mid to late 20th century and the current Occupy movement is a willingness to experiment with new forms of mobilization, tactics, strategies, democratic processes, and institutional and organizational forms. To move forward, however, will be no easy task. A black political movement must do a number of things. It must address the issue of racial resentment, giving Americans a, a context for listening to each other so they begin to understand their real mutual interest. It must innovate and experiment with political institutions and rebuild the black public sphere. Rebuilding the black public sphere necessitates nurturing the multiple political ideologies that once fueled black debate, including black versions of socialism, nationalism, feminism, and social democracy, and nurture the willingness to cast out what is no longer useful and criticize blacks who mislead, including the president. It must hit the street in large numbers and in unity with those forces organizing for progressive change, indeed progressive blacks as in the past, We'll need to work with both black and multiracial organizations to have, for black politics to have its full positive effect. It must renew the commitment to the value of meaningful work for a living wage and to an educational system that only, not only makes acquiring meaningful and rewarding work possible, but also allows for each person to discover what it means to flourish while contributing to society. Finally, must reclaim the brow, broad, proud, radical anti-imperialist tradition of black politics. In conclusion, if a group aims to be truly emancipatory, if it is to transcend narrow self-interest and to inspire others to join its cause, this mission must be universal. Black politics must rededicate itself to overturning white supremacy, not only state sanctioned white supremacy, but also the variety that still permeates civil society in the United States. To win a better life not only for the black poor, but for humanity more generally, black politics must also rededicate itself to fighting the rogue capitalism today that dominates all aspects of our lives. Then black politics will once again entail nothing less than the thorough transformation of American society, economy, and government. Thank you. Okay. I apologize for being late. I'm Melissa Nobles, professor of political science, and I'm going to be moderating uh, today. 
I, I mean, I did, you know, I was stimulated very much by reading the um, Boston Review pieces, and both Michael's uh, essay and the responses to it. And it struck me immediately as one kind of small irony we're talking about kind of black politics when we have the first uh, black American president. And I mean, on its face, it would seem somewhat paradoxical that is, that, we, that somehow we reached the crisis at the very point when arguably we should have felt as if we've arrived. And I think that Michael very, you know, articulates very well in certain ways the frustration with that, which is that we seem to be at a crossroads, at least in regards to black progressive <laughs> traditions, at the very moment when we've, got, we've reached the epitome of political power. With that, we've got two of our panelists, Andra and Phil, who have both have written extensively about black elites, that is, black mayors. And so I, I'm going to ask a question as a way of starting off this conversation, which is Michael said in his talk that um, certain of some of the lead, some of the failure of the uh, uh, in explaining the failure of black progressivism must be laid at the feet of black elected officials, right? This new generation. So there's one generation that came in the 1970s, right? The first wave of black uh, at once blacks could vote. Many black people started voting, electing black mayors, and now arguably we're in our second generation of black mayors. So I wonder if you all would agree with Michael that that they failed in some kind of way. Are they have they been any better and any worse at meeting the needs of poor and working class uh, blacks, and, um, and 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 is he right in pointing out the limits of electoral politics? So I'll start first with Andre and then Phil, if we could take that. So I'd say both sets of mayors have failed. So the first set of mayors failed, and, and, and in part this was a, a structural failure. They got into office at a time where uh, federal government was reducing direct aid to cities. Um, and at a time during um, severe economic decline. So the transition from um, a, a manufacturing to a service-based service economy uh, was really underway. It had been underway for a generation, but people really started to realize in the 70s and 80s what was happening. And so black mayors came into power at a time when really there wasn't a whole lot that they could do. So they, re they relied on what they could do, which was sometimes building a shiny new building or helping middle class blacks with affirmative action for the younger mayors. Uh, who For are example, given. like the ones I study, like the Adrian Fentys and the Cory Bookers um, uh, of the world, who actually represent a third wave in African American politics. This is a group of folks who think that they can apply neoliberal traditions to being able to solve these entrenched problems uh, that still persist in, in, in communities of color. And part of the reason why they want to do so is that they personally have benefited from neoliberalism. And so they think that if it works for them, then surely it works for everything else. And so they encounter one resistance from their own communities, particularly black constituents within their communities, who are not used <coughs> to seeing things framed in a neoliberal kind of fashion. If there's anything that first wave black mayors did well, was that they were able to frame things in terms of populism, even if they weren't doing a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, um, but these younger mayors, they eschew that language completely and then wonder why there's a backlash against them. So you're talking about Fenty, for example. Fenty, Booker, I mean, this, it, all of them have experienced this type of backlash, and, and Fenty in, in a very acute way because it ended up booting him out of office. Right. Um, and then there's the governance issue of, well, what has actually happened? And, and since these folks have been in office really for the last five years or so, our, our analysis is confounded by the economic crisis, so they'll just blame everything on the recession. But the reality of it is, is as we watch them maneuver strategically, there's a steep learning curve. And so, yeah, it's great that you went to Harvard or MIT or wherever you went to school. It's great that you have a good technical training. But the fact that these folks are coming in at a severe you know, period of economic distress, and they're actually coming in relatively young and inexperienced from a work standpoint, actually means that it's much, much more difficult for them to be able to do the things that even they claim to achieve. And I think the thing that's a little problematic about it is that in particular because they've embraced the language of neoliberalism, they embrace the notion of a multiracial coalition, they're often very trusting and they align themselves with forces who have absolutely no intention of actually improving the lives of communities of color. And so it's a question of whether or not they're self-aware enough to realize when they're being had. And I think that that actually helps to animate a lot of the frustration and a lot of the backlash against them. It was at least assumed that if the older black mayors were cashing in for themselves or unable to deliver, that they at least understood when, to borrow a phrase that President Obama used in 2008, the okie doke was on. And it's not clear that the younger people actually realize when they're getting had. Bill? Uh, I actually, I, I agree with everything Andre says, so I'd like to uh, change my answer. Sure, go ahead. Um, is, <laughs> hey, that's what this, this is a panel discussion. Uh, first, I, I think it's important not to kind of talk about black politics in the same way we ordinarily talk about American politics is you talk about elected officials and voters. Um, 
I, I think in black politics it's very important to talk about movements and also other actors. Um, because black politics has never been about just voters and elected officials. And uh, in the late 60s, there was an early 70s, there was a lot of debate in the black community about how valuable can electoral politics be. For many of the reasons that um, Michael was talking about. I mean, black activists just didn't start talking about imperialism or global, the word neoliberalism didn't exist then, but people were talking about the same thing in the late 60s. Go back and read uh, Huey Newton and what he wrote about, you James know, Fox. or James Boggs or Grace Lee, well, she's technically not black, but she's pretty black. Grace Lee Boggs <laughs> and, you know, go back and read any of these people, you know, who were writing at the time. And this is what they, Martin Luther King for that matter. Go back and, and look at what they were talking about. They were talking about this stuff. And Michael and I actually, embarrassingly, old enough to remember some of those debates. Speak for yourself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We and were in those debates. Let's we were in those debates. <laughs> and the response of um, black leaders who wanted to run for office was, no, we'll use these offices as like bases. Like it was almost like, you know, if you were going to use a Mao strategy, capture the countryside and, and then attack the cities, it was like, we'll take all these offices and then we'll use that as bases to take the struggle to a higher level. And the first black congressional caucus like, had an extremely progressive program. It talked about all the issues, the environmental issues, the health issues, cutting the, the military budget to fund you know, transformation in the country and, and all of that. Um, but what happened was that link to the activism on the ground became broken pretty quickly. Um, and Andy Young once wrote, uh, he wrote an introduction to a book called The Closing Door by Gary Orfield and Carol Ashkenazi. And, it, and, and I don't know, he, it was a, maybe a special moment for him or something. I don't know what it was. Um, but he wrote in that book, he said, we knew at, in, in, after Martin Luther King was killed and they started talking about affirmative action, mm -hmm. we knew that this was going to just help a few of us who were in the upper middle class, whose kids could even think about going to a Harvard or an MIT or a Penn or any of these institutions, we knew that the masses of black people would be excluded and left behind if we went for this. But we were scared of being red baited and we were scared of being attacked. Um, so we went with that. He said that. So the special moment was that he was being unusually candid? He was being unusually <laughs> candid. I mean, and. I think that's true. I, I, you know, show me the first black demonstration for affirmative action. Go back, look at Eyes on the Prize a million times. Find me black people demonstrating in the street for affirmative action. Black people were demonstrating in the street for full employment, for jobs. That's what King's whole thing was about when he was killed, for fundamental transformation. That's where the black community was. And I totally agree with Michael about, you know, where we are now. I just wanted to mention a couple other actors. Going What's going on now, I see, what I see right now, um, I see uh, one of the forces that's very important if we're going to talk about rebuilding black politics is black labor. Um, that is one area where we do have some independent black power right now. And I'm talking about, for example, Local 1199 of SEIU, which are hospital workers. There are 500,000 hospital workers in 1199. It's headed up by George Gresham, African American. And you know, many black leaders now in the labor movement. And these are people that a lot of our black civil rights leaders, quote unquote, are now trying to curry favor with. Like Al Sharpton, like Jesse Jackson, like uh, Ben Jealous, like Van Jones. You know, um, They're trying to curry favor with these folks because these folks have their deep pockets. How do they do that? They do it by trying to get on TV because many of these black labor leaders do, have, do not have connections with black community organizations. And people like Al Sharpton and others, they come to these labor leaders saying, I can get the black community behind stuff you want to get done. How can I do that? Well, I have a show on MSNBC. And uh, you know, I, I'm out there and I can help you do that. Some labor leaders, such as a guy running for president of Ask Me Right Now, um, 
really lack of uh, any kind of connection with the black community itself. And so they bring in an Al Sharpton to help him win his own campaign within his own union for presidency. And Al charges money, OK? It costs money. Sadly to say, Obama is using Al in the same way right now. Because Obama doesn't really have strong ties with the black community. That game is going on. And then what we see now in black politics is we see Sharpton versus Jesse Jackson versus Ben Jealous versus Van Jones all fighting with each other to be the one who goes to 1199 or goes to Ask Me and gets that big paycheck and, and we can deliver more than the others. And none of them are doing base building in the community you know, none of that work of actually bringing together people across communities, having the dialogues, building the trust, having the conversations about what needs to be done, it's not happening. Last thing I wanted to mention was I also think the black Latino conversation is crucial right now. And a quarter million um, uh, Latinos were rounded up in Arizona last year. Um, there are draconian, racist uh, measures that have been passed against immigrants in <coughs> Alabama uh, and Georgia right now. Um, and building that conversation between black and Latinos, I think, is a crucial issue for black power. Why? Some students of mine just ran some numbers, and we did some mapping. And close to, if you look at LA, Miami, and New York, we looked at those cities huge numbers of immigrants who cannot vote, taxpaying immigrants, I'm talking about legal immigrants. In those cities, at least 30% of the taxpaying adult voting age population can't vote because of immigrant status. If you add to that ex-felons who can't vote in a place like Miami, you're at nearly 50% of the population there can't vote. If you added undocumented workers, in those cities who can't vote. We're talking about a majority population in three, in three of our major cities who can't, I, I mean, more than three. We only measure, looked at three. Chicago would be the same. Houston, we, we looked at these cities, they cannot vote. And I think if you wanna know why it is that political power is waning, why it is black mayors, really people are bypassing them, um, in not paying a whole lot of attention to black elected officials anymore. Part of it is because there's a huge disenfranchisement going on due to our voting laws. Um, and I think the way to fight that, we have to build a conversation with Latino leaders because we're both being disenfranchised. And in 18 of the 20 largest cities in America, the, uh, a majority of residents are non-white. Well, there's a certain tension tone which you're saying there, right, on the one hand, which is, as you began, saying that there are limits to electoral politics, right, which we, which I agree with you with, right, that there are limits to what it can do, particularly in regards to progressivism. But then we also have to be, but it's not even as if, as limited as electoral politics are, we're not even secure in that, right? Because you're saying that voting rights are being challenged, right? I mean, all, we all have been watching the attempts to different, to make, vote under the claim of voter uh, fraud, right, um, Making it more difficult for people to register right, in in in, in uh, to suppress democratic turnout for this upcoming election. So while we may have our skepticism about electoral politics, it still isn't our place in it. Still isn't secure, right? So there's a certain tension about where to put one's energies. Is that a part of the problem that we may be disenchanted with electoral politics, um, but it has created some successes if we think about it in a, just a purely uh, kind of a basic way. We have black elected officials, and we want to, you know, we want to participate in the body politic. And at the same time, we want to go past it. Our ten, our energies may be stretched. Is that? Am I being Pollyannish about it, or is it? Can we do more than one thing? <laughs> Please. A um, couple things. One is I think don't think we can aff afford building on what um, Phil and Andre said to ignore any form of politics. Um, we are weak enough where. We don't have the luxury of saying we can't do electoral politics, that we can't engage in mass protests, that we can't, you know, we don't need to do boycotts anymore. I think we have to experiment to find out what are the most effective, but that is a political resource, like, the, like labor is a political resource that is severely underutilized and represents potential latent power 
that needs a ton of infrastructural and base building to realize. I just want to make one little historical note. I think Andrew's a little too hard on the new mayors, uh, only because if you think about Coleman Young, uh, Coleman Young was, came out of the communist movement, he was a trade union leader, he was, came out of the black power movement, and he pioneered neoliber neoliberalism <laughs> when, before, the, before the word was invented. I think the, the difference was that he was able to talk to talk, as you suggested, and therefore um, convince people that he, that he wasn't the one pulling the hokey doke. <laughs> While the new ones don't even bother to talk to talk, but he actually was just as destructive as you think about Detroit and black politics in Detroit as any of the younger mayors sir. With that, can I just ask, just, uh, have there been any black progressive mayors? I mean, some that would, that would kind of satisfy that definition. So we, we had a model, like a mayor like this versus is there one, Harold Washington? I would say I would say yes, but I think I, I, I think Kwame in in um, Atlanta. Oh, oh no. I, I mean, cause, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> right. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> not him. Not him. <laughs> but no, my point was that what makes a black mayor progressive is never the personality. Like Howard Washington came out of a whole movement, yeah. and a movement got created to elect Dinkins, and then Dinkins started veering off in a neoliberal direction, and a movement like pulled him, back. Pulled him right back very quickly, uh, and 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 that's why I, th I think it's key to think for African Americans and other marginalized groups to think about politics, not just you vote, you go home, and you wait for good things to happen. A couple of examples. There's a, uh, the New York City Comptroller right now is a Korean American elected with the black vote. The guy who preceded him was an African American from Brooklyn, Billy Thompson. The Comptroller of New York is the sole decision maker on $100 billion of New York City workers' pension funds. Two years ago, when they had the election for Comptroller, for the first time in New York history, many voting districts in the Bronx, Queens, some in Brooklyn, had zero turnout, zero, for the first time ever. Okay, the New York City mayor has a $40 billion budget. We had a black mayor there. And he was elected with no agenda, no agenda. So what, what I'm suggesting is that if you want a progressive black mayor or Latino mayor, then work has to be done to actually figure out what to do with the office, yeah. what to do with the resources that are there. Just talking about voting will get you Nothing. It will get you a symbolic figure with a black face who talks neoliberal stuff and does the same thing as the previous mayor. That's, and we have not tackled that. We continue to elect people with absolutely no agenda attached to it. But it's not just elected officials, though, right? I mean, King talked about the majority of black ministers were not progressive. Um, so, I mean, whether we're talking about any set of elites, but we're talking specifically about black elites, whether we're talking about in the academy, in the church, um, in elected office, and even a mass movement, a democratic movement to hold them accountable. We're, we're all likely to do crazy stuff that's in our own self-interest if there's not a movement there to keep mm -hmm. us honest. I, I couldn't agree more. And so I, I, I think of Ron Walters when I, I'm listening to you both talk where he talked about the inside-outside strategy so that there was the need to have black elected officials in positions of power and exercising the rights that were gained by the civil rights movement, but also keeping a robust protest movement in order to make issues salient so that black elected officials who were t uh, susceptible to being co-opted by sort of the larger power structures that they were in could sort of point to public opinion as evidenced by protests to say that we need to address certain types of issues. The concern that I have is accountability. And so you could see somebody like a Coleman Young being draconian and going after his enemies with gusto um, and using it as an opportunity to sort of say that he was speaking truth to power when he eliminated his uh, political enemies or anybody who countered him. But the younger ones do the exact same thing. They just do it in very different ways. And that's usually to malign the people who criticize them as being uncouth, ghetto, or, or, or mm -hmm. what have you. And that's equally problematic. So you know, one of the things that I, I thought about is I had a student who worked for Archer Davis during his gubernatorial campaign. Explain, and tell me. Archer Davis uh, represented uh, Birmingham, Alabama in Congress um, during most of the 2000s. He got elected by beating Earl Hilliard, a longstanding uh, black congressman from, um, from, from Alabama. Uh, he was very much in the Harvard neoliberal tradition. He uh, ran for governor in 2010, so he gave up his congressional seat to try to secure the Democratic nomination, was supposed to have won the nomination, was probably not going to win the governor's race overall. 
in anticipation of his run and in an attempt to try to appeal to um, white voters in Alabama, he voted against the Obama health care bill. And um, voters in Alabama, Democratic voters, paid him back. And they actually ended up voting for um, a, a white state commissioner over him in the Democratic primary, which was not supposed to happen. And we saw a large defection of African American voters from Davis uh, to this guy, Ron Sparks, who was the agricultural commissioner at the time. And one of the things that uh, explains Davis's loss is, in part, his vote on health care. It was also he had really upset um, the black political bosses in Alabama when he first beat Earl Hilliard. Um, eight years before and hadn't really made amends with them during this time period. And one of my students, she took my class, she read Michael Dawson's Behind the Mule, so she knew all about linked fate. She could not understand how people would vote against a black person. She was like, but what about linked fate? And it's and, and unfortunately, it's this very naive and unsophisticated view of black political cohesion that lends itself to young black political leaders who haven't spent enough time in the trenches and haven't examined these issues very deeply, making the kinds of mistakes that they do. And I think that that's actually a critical difference between the Coleman Youngs mm -hmm. and a lot of these younger people, is that they really do assume that they've got the black vote on lock because they're black. And it's like, yeah, but we watched how you vote. And so it's a credit to African-American voters that they are uh, sophisticated enough to realize that just because somebody shares my racial or ethnic identity doesn't necessarily mean that they act in my interest. And I think they in particular, because they have this very naive and unsophisticated view of linked fate, actually really take it the wrong way and really take it personally when they get challenged by black people. Um, and granted, the language is sometimes crude and people will say that you're not black enough, but really what they're saying is we're not sure that you represent our interests just because you happen to share the same skin color that I do. And that's really important. I think it's a hard lesson for this young group to realize and the people who are watching them and following them and waiting in the wings to kind of run for office in the next five to 15 years. Um, Michael and all of you have said that there was a part of the black public sphere. I'm going to, after this, I'm going to end and we're going to open up for questions. Um, but the, um, where progressivism was born, I mean, there's a, there was a point, right, where there, there was, there was something in black civic life where there was more of, it was an incubator, right? And one of the institutions we mentioned where King called out the church as not being progressive enough. Um, but what were certain of the other institutions that were sources of progressive thought? I mean, I'm thinking about the black press, for example, and how have changes in the press in general affected the black press, right? We do have a more robust, a more interesting and varied media landscape, but I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure what it's made of. I mean, I don't, between BET and some of these black radio stations, you know, I'm about ready to jump out the window. I mean, I can't <laughs> listen to it, right? right? I mean, we've got more access and there's more nonsense. So I'm, so I, so I wonder, you know, what what are the sources of that were traditionally used to be the place, right? We do have the Legal Defense Fund, which continues to do its hard work, right? I mean, they may not be the heroes as they used to be, right? I mean, Thurgood Marshall and others used to be household names. I'm not sure if anyone knows who the head of the NAAC Legal Defense Fund are doing the hard work of representing us with these uh, challenges to the affirmative action cases. So I'm just wondering, kind of what, you know, what can we need to, what, where, do, where do we need to go in the organic places that existed in the past? to create this progressive movement such that it's not coming from the top, but it's coming from the bottom. Where it, because as you mentioned, as, as your research shows, Michael, most black Americans are quite to the left, at least in, in regards to looking at white public opinion. We are on, on the left on most, on most things. Well, I mean, there's a number of bases. Um, mostly, mostly you're talking about institutional type, institutions that either are weaker or disconnected from black politics than, than they weren't. But, there were unions. I mean, a number of the leaders in and out of the progressive movement in electoral politics came out of uh, union struggles, either union leadership directly or black caucuses or third world caucuses within those unions uh, were one sort of block clubs, um, black fraternal, or and fraternal organizations, um, st uh, very active and politicized black student groups throughout the United States and HCBUs, but also in predominantly white campuses across the country. The military was another source of organized black protest. Um, an independent black press um, that was not corporately owned. So there were numerous um, relatively independent and autonomous and weak but vibrantly grounded um, black institutions that struggled with each other. I mean, I think, um, I don't know about Phil, but I know that in the, in the black left in the 60s and 70s, 
uh, if your feelings got hurt and somebody said you weren't black enough, then you really were in the wrong business. Um, there were, you know, there were used to be um, that a hundred flowers bloom meant that everybody was after you and you, you needed to show what you could do <laughs> for African Americans and both not just in talk but having an agenda. Now we, we struggled, you know, there were many types of nationalists, there were many types of Marxists, there were many types of liberals um, and out of all of whom had an agenda and an organization trying to convince many black people that they had the best program. Now we have people without agendas and without organizations. That's not a good place for a political movement to be. <laughs> I would just add that uh, um, I, I was glad Michael mentioned uh, the academy because black colleges was also a source mm -hmm. of a lot of black leadership. The NAACP really came out of black colleges. Yeah. And, and so did SCLC. And so did SCLC and uh, so did King. Um, yeah. Some did the Panthers, some of the Panthers. A lot of the Panthers. You know, and in 1964, Du Bois wrote that he proposed a black tax, that black people <laughs> ought to impose a tax on themselves to support black colleges so that blacks would have a center for strategic thinking, activism, cultivating leadership. Otherwise, he thought we'd end up like the Roma, you know, like gypsies, you know, being torn in a thousand different directions by these more powerful institutions in the broader society and being manipulated by them because we didn't have any internal coherent structures for, for thinking through things. And <clears throat> I think now there are, given the internet, there are possibilities of rebuilding in ways uh, that didn't exist before in terms of, you know, critical uh, media and, and all of that. But I think that's a huge thing that's lacking. There used to be a journal called The Black Scholar. And like, Everybody who was active was reading the Black Scholar, writing articles for the Black Scholar, debating the Black world, the Black world, the the African world, um, newspaper, and you know all these things were like were were there, and now it's hard to find. And one of the implications, a lot of unions, for example, give money to organizations, white organizations, to organize in Black communities around elections. That should not be allowed, but. Most black folks don't even know it. You have plenty of indigenous black organizations that just don't go into a black community to try and sign up a voter, but actually talk to black people about what they want. And it's not just one way a union hiring some white organization to go recruit black people to vote for this one or that one, but it's pushback from the ground up to whoever this candidate is saying, no, 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 you just can't talk about this or talk. That's not happening. And we're almost at the point where this whole thing's about to repeat itself. Most folks don't even know that's going on. You know, we have black organizations in the community that are dying due to lack of resources, and we have white organizations who are getting tons of money to come into black and Latino communities because they don't make unions, there's no pushback. They just collect the money, then they go hire somebody who was dealing drugs one day, the next day they're signing people up for voter registration. People in the community know it's not deep. Right? They know it's not serious. And that's a political campaign. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a if we want to see Barack Obama reelected, because Barack will end up doing stuff like that, unless there's some kind of pushback. You know, I, I think it's possible, but, w you know, it's not happening right now. I'm just, you want to add to I mean, I just see all of this as evidence of a multiracial plutocracy. And so I think that that's essentially what this is at this point. So that essentially what has happened is, is everybody recognizes the value of descriptive diversity. And so you can't have institutions remain lily white forever. So you take in a few elites, it converts a sense of legitimacy on the entire project. And then everybody goes on and they do what they want to do. And the people who make it into the elite have every interest to kind of keep things as they are as the status quo without any self-reflection at all about what is going on. And especially if you've been socialized into this working and you look at yourself and you think that you are the heir of King's dream, then well, so be it. And then everybody else just hasn't worked hard enough. And so that may explain the differences between you and everybody else. It's unfortunate, I mean, I hate to be so pessimistic, but I've actually kind of gotten to the point now where I see two black movements 
and I and, and I've kind of thrown my hands up and said well this is probably how it's going to be and so people need to learn to make distinctions not just on race lines but also on class and self-interest lines as well when they're judging black leaders and so you know the unity the patina of <coughs> unity that we thought we, we we've seen for the last a couple of generations really isn't there in it and getting us back to that point I'm not quite sure what it would take it would probably take some massively racist moment that affected Oprah to the person <laughs> on the corner to get everybody to sort of you know recognize exactly what structures were actually calling the shots can I say one other thing yeah yeah um because you you're I'm getting upset um <laughs> But uh, Michael's from Chicago. He can speak to this more than me. But I went to the headquarters of the Obama campaign in Chicago in 2008. And I looked at their uh, get out the vote operation, the computer operation they did, the sophisticated targeting. I was searching for one black face in front of a computer screen, one black face in any of it. And you were surprised? I was searching. Well, I'm not from Chicago. I didn't know, you know. And my, but what really concerns me is I don't see, I don't think people know this even. I don't see people pushing back, you know, to well, the campaign. But the only way to push back is what, not to vote for him? I mean, what I'm saying is he, he got what percentage of the black vote? 98 percent? 96 percent? Well, what I think is going to happen is uh, unless, unless there is some activism, I think a lot of people won't vote. Yeah. They won't turnout. vote okay, for. So it's be turnout. They turnout won't. Yes, the and turnout is key. If he doesn't get a high black turnout, he will not win. He will not win. And so that's that's to me, it's a great concern because for all of David Pluff's brilliance and for all of David Axelrod's brilliance, they don't know squat about how to mobilize the black vote at all, and it, and it's absolutely crucial. Well, when you say, I mean, I'm going to say that provocatively, then I'm opening it up, right? One could say that Obama's camp. You all can correct me here, but didn't they kind of run in 2008 kind of a dog whistle campaign? I mean, we've heard that in regards to the white, right, right. But in this regard, send Michelle out to do certain things, belatedly start <coughs> advertising on black radio, saying certain things that would galvanize the black vote. It wouldn't take much symbolically. Bring Michelle and the girls out to certain places, blah, blah, show them together. The, a couple of photo ops and him waving and, you know, and that's it. He's like, he's like African politics, big man politics. He comes out, he goes like this, and we vote for him, right? I mean, it may, may, may it just be that he's, there's such an emotional connection to him, at least the first time around, that he didn't have to do much. But what you all are suggesting is that he's going to have to do a lot more this time because we've had four years of a recession, the black American unemployment is 15%, and blah, blah. I mean, we've, we, we haven't benefited, and maybe symbolic politics aren't enough anymore. Is that what you all? Actually, I think this is what Phil is trying to push me to say, um, <laughs> which is that it's worse than that, um, oh. because his first two political campaigns were to run against people, black incumbents to the left of him, mm -hmm. defeating uh, Alice Palmer, who was a, a, a in black. Black incumbent, and then running against Bobby Rush, who's certainly not to the far left, but but Barack ran to the right of him. And one of my former students um, worked fairly high up in the early Obama campaigns, and he said straight up, and he was a, a working class young man from Cleveland, African American, says that they come to the conclusion that they really didn't need poor blacks. Um, that their target was the white upper white upper middle class and the white and the black upper middle class and that was their coalition that's going to be their coalition and they're going to ride it all the way to the top. Can I just say that is a view within the Obama sort of team, but I, the way I think of the Obama administration is it's a coalition. It's wrong to think of it as like everybody thinks this way and everybody thinks. I'm that just saying way. that's how Barack thought. I, I can't speak to that, so <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving that to you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I, but I do think there are other people in the Obama administration who are radically opposed to that point of view. Oh, and one thing Obama is very good at is making sure that nobody talks like that. We don't know that. Like folks, you don't hear a lot of folks airing out what their differences are in public right. in, yeah. in the Obama administration. They're very tight in that regard. But I don't think, I think that's why it has to be resolved outside of the Obama administration. Yeah. OK. Questions? I um, saw a hand up. Yes. Hi, I'm Mia White. I'm a PhD student here, one of the Bell students, and a former urban studies and planning black pediatrician in New York. Quick comment. Um, I, 
I know everybody knows this, or I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but we really need to move sort of beyond this idea of the black community. It's fundamental to how we begin to evolve and transform our own politics. There is no homogenous, uniform, flat black community. There are many black communities in many black public spheres. We start with the first point. Second point is we talked about symbolic politics. You know, from my perspective, there seems to be a very strong conservatism in so the so-called black symbolic politics. In other words, we are assuaged when we see the picture of, and, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not beyond this myself, of see Barack, Michelle, and the two girls. This perfect, you know, heterosexual, middle class, upper middle class, we have achieved. What, I'm, what, what bothers me, however, even though part of me is mollified and in fact happy, thrilled, even moved to tears to see the beauty of that. <coughs> There's also something that really bothers me, which is where is the pro-poor message? The, the so-called the so -called black community, which in my perspective is older and conservative, does not have a pro-poor agenda. It has a look, we're middle class too agenda. And it, it profoundly bothers me. I do work in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, organizing, or, or I'm not organizing ministers. I am trying to provide data that will help those who organize ministers. There is a really young, powerful, progressive African-American minister who is battling older, conservative uh, parishioners who don't want to deal with those who are either dealing drugs or addicted to drugs or who are prostituting or who are single moms or who are on welfare. They have been deemed by older conservative uh, black folks who are powerful and voting as that's not who we are. In fact, let's actually make them invisible. It's okay to raise those homes because we don't want them here anyway. And, and part of my concern is there is this undercover meme you know, this thread, which is, it is about showing everybody that we can achieve, we are as smart, we are as da 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 da, da instead of saying, this is, a, this is about the beloved community. This is about, this is about loving and embracing and advocating on behalf of those who are really, really struggling. This is not about showing and proving that we can be president, that we can go to Yale, that we can become a professor, and that we're middle class. And so, I, and so the first point about why continue to use this idea of the black community? I mean, you know, <coughs> I've, and I've had some, you know, uh, heated conversations with Phil, you know, earlier in my, in my, when I first got here about that. But, but, but at the same time, why do we persist in this perspective? Why? I mean, I don't get it. And I think you would say, well, we know that. But why keep saying it? And then second, do you agree with this sort of conservative thing, which disallows for us to talk about, to talk about developing a true pro-poor agenda? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I'll start with the second one and then move to the first one. The second one, I, I think one of the very dangerous, dangerous illogical turns is that in the 21st century, we have a marrying of two ideologies that make it easy to dismiss the black poor. One is an old-fashioned politics of respectability that has always um, been a strong theme in the black middle and upper middle class of saying those poor people are poor because they're not like me and, you know, I'm one of the most articulate and self-consciously proud advocates of this point of view is Skip Gates. Um, those who are ready were benefited by affirmative action. Those who weren't are lazy. And but Bill Wilson, too, in his blaming of single white side. This is all being filmed. I just yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, I've drunk enough with Skip to, and told him the same thing. He just calls me an old-fashioned socialist. So, I mean, we can, we can go. Um, but... Um, but the, the, the problem is you have the prop, the, one of the a new problems is we have the politics of respectability, which goes back to the earliest 20th century. Uh, one of the biggest insults on the blacks on the south side of Chicago in the middle class was calling somebody country, which was essentially calling them working class, um, with, the with the politics of neoliberalism. So now we have a new technical, fancy, education-based language married to the old-fashioned politics of respectability that reinforces heteronormativity, <coughs> reinforces patriarchy, reinforces uh, a classism, 
and, reinforce, and reinforces, and this is probably some of us on the, uh, who are more progressive, probably more as guilty of this one too, uh, an ageism that dismisses the young, dismisses the poor, and this is misses a particularly a class politics within the black community, and that politics is kind of threatening to those who have so self-righteously earned their current status. In terms of the first, I, I totally agree. When, when I think talk about, I don't talk about black public spheres. I talk about publics of publics. I mean, I'm talking about how different black publics get aggregated. Um, and using Kathy Cohen's work, some of them are marginal. Many of them are marginalized within black discourse themselves, are demonized within black discourse. I think too many of us coming out of the '60s and '70s, and including myself used the shorthand of black community when we were in struggles where we, there was no way we could represent what we were involved in as one black community. It was like we were part of multiple black communities and a very complicated black identities. But we're, what we don't have now that to some degree we had even in the 70s despite the passage of 65 and 67 was a rigid uh, racialized social order that was state sanctioned that affected black people across the board. That was one of the reasons. What was one of the institutional reasons that some of the class differences could at least be muted, if not entirely uh, overcome. We don't have that now, and the class di divisions that were always there are now becoming sharper. Um, and the middle class is the one that has institutional power now and is re redefining what is normal, what is black politics in a way that's detrimental to those who are most disadvantaged. <laughs> So, I mean, one, I think part of the reason why you tend to use the shorthand of black communities is also it's a reflection of a collective action problem. And so if we mm -hmm. all fractured into all of our different black communities, then we wouldn't ever get anything done. And so it's a lot easier to talk about a lot of that common stuff. So there's certain things that do affect black people across the board or are perceived to, and so it makes sense to organize around those. Since Michael brought up Kathy and since Kathy taught me, one of the issues <laughs> that she brings up in secondary marginalization is that those who are in power actually have an incentive to doubly marginalize other people because this is how they get their legitimacy. So you get currency by throwing somebody under the bus, and so that's part of the reason why, why they do it, because they recognize that they have actually a very tenuous hold on power themselves, and the only way that they can maintain that power is by distancing themselves from anything that looks remotely pathological. So that's why those older people in their communities don't want to have anything to do with those folks because they think they make them look bad. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually sort of a negative version of linked fate. So when I actually te teach linked fate to my students, I said, especially when I have classes that are majority African American, I always ask, have you ever watched the news and you hear about some murder and the first thing you say is, please don't let the person be black? <laughs> that's like a negative version of linked fate. And so it, it's just manifesting itself in that particular way. Can I say one thing? I, I, use the word, I, one, I use the word black community for another reason, and that is um, Orlando Patterson, who I disagree with on Everything. just about. But, but <laughs> he wrote an article once which I, I thought was really insightful. And, and he said, actually, black Americans are some of the least essentialized people on earth in the sense that they don't know where in Africa they're from. So they, they don't say, like, I'm a Nigerian and I trace my, or I'm a, you know, you know a Ghanaian or I'm a, you know, they, they are like, they, they really are not essentialists in that way. And they're much more out forward looking and, and compared to, you know, just about anybody. That's the true of Africans. So he pointed that out. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons I use black community and try and and remind people about black history, movement history. Frederick Douglass supported the Mexicans in 1848, right? Black people need to be reminded of that. Um, Frederick, the Haitian Revolution is where the Venezuelan Revolution <laughs> came from because they were into solidarity. Frederick Douglass was the first ambassador to Haiti because that, he saw that as part of the African-American struggle, They've, the NAACP is called the NAACP because Du Bois and others said we cannot separate our struggle from what's going on in Egypt, the Philippines, or Central America because they are suffering the same thing we are and there's no accident why European capital picks people of color to, do, to treat this way. And, and so that's part of the tradition in the black community that I want to use that, you know, and revive that, not for purposes of keeping it small, and narrow, but reminding people how we've always viewed our situation in America. How can we be 100% Americans just concerned about America when we couldn't even vote in America? You know, until the, I was in junior high school, 
when my mother had to go and stoop behind a tree because she wasn't good enough to go to the bathroom in a gas station. You know, are we really part of this? Or do we see ourselves as part of something bigger? 